Barna Research, which is a, uh, a research company like Gallup, only they focus mostly in church world. Barna Research recently surveyed 2,005 people, not the year 2005, but 2,005 people, ages 17 to 27. And, and when they do this, this is a, an across the board demographic. It is not, they're not, they don't all live in Los Angeles or New York, you know, something like that. They're, they're surveying people from across the country. They got 2,005 people to respond. And I just want to share with you some of the results of that survey, because it really challenges me as a pastor. And it should challenge us just as followers of Jesus, because 1,424 of those people said that they like, love, or respect Jesus. They like, love, or respect Jesus. But... Only 300 of those people said they like, love, or respect Christians. Wow. Yeah. That's us. 962 of them said that Christians are judgmental. Another 942 said Christians are hypocritical. Uh, only out of 2,005 people, only 440 said they would attend or would consider attending a church. So you say to me, Jim, well, what's the problem? Well, part of the problem, it's not the only problem, but part of the problem is you and I suffer from the older son syndrome. The older son syndrome. You remember in Luke chapter 15, Jesus tells three stories. And we've talked about these stories. I love telling these stories. We just sang a song about the reckless love of God that goes out and looks for the lost sheep and leaves 99 sheep behind to go out and look for the one lost sheep. And no one in their right mind would do that. And, and so we, we find the story of the lost sheep. We find the story of the lost coin. The woman who goes to extreme measures to find a penny in her house. And the lost son, uh, which I often refer to as the story of the waiting father. But there is a fourth story that's kind of hidden in the story of the lost son. And that fourth story I call the story about a lost opportunity. The lost opportunity. It is the story of the older son. It is a story that reminds us that as followers of Jesus, as followers of Jesus, if we don't practice integrity and credibility and authenticity in our lives, that we've just lost out. Now, integrity is the is the quality of being honest and having a strong and moral principle. Credibility is the, the quality of being trusted and believed. And authenticity is faithfully resembling the original. In other words, faithfully resembling Jesus, following Jesus better. And Jesus tells these three stories, and they're really about credibility and authenticity and integrity. He tells these three stories... And at the end of the story of the, the waiting father, the lost son, the father throws a party because his long lost son has returned. But there's somebody missing from this party. And remember, this was before you had two-way radios or cell phones. So the older son, it wasn't that he was missing because he, he wasn't informed. It was that he was missing because he couldn't be informed. And so Jesus tells the story, and while the father and his younger son and everybody in the household that was there is celebrating, this happens. Meanwhile, this is in Luke chapter 15, starting at verse 25. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near to the house... He heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants. And whenever you see the word servant in the story, it's slave. Just remember it's slave. 
he called one of the slaves and asked him what was going on. And this is what the slave told him. He says, your brother has come. Your brother has come. And your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. Whoa. Can you imagine how this smacks the older son right up the side of the head? I mean, it's like a two by four. And I just want to remind you of some things that happened in this story that, that should be a lesson to us. First of all, when, when the older son decides to investigate this, he, um, he, he, he relies on secondhand information. So he, we should reject secondhand information. We should reject it. We, we should always go to the source. That's one of the lessons that Jesus teaches us in Matthew 18, where he says, if somebody has something against you, if you have somebody something against someone else, go directly to them. Avoid making triangles. Because what did this older son immediately do? The older son lets the, the servant, the slave, know, I'm not going to this party. I'm not going to this party. And so he makes a, a triangle um, out of this situation. And it's, it's, those things are destructive, my friends. They really are. When we involve people in conflict that don't belong in conflict, we bring destruction and confusion and discouragement and depression and all kinds of things into the situation. And somehow we have to learn not to do this. We have to go directly to the people. Because what happened? The older brother became angry and refused to go in. And so who goes back to report this? The slave, the servant. Goes to the father and says, your son, you know, the, the one who was out taking care of the, the chores out in the field, he won't come in. He won't come in. And wow, friends, you know, that, that kind of impact of negative behavior, that's really hard. That's really hard. You know, every one of you has experienced a family member, a friend, a co-worker, a neighbor who rejects and puts up a wall and says, I'm not having any part in this. I don't want to do this. This isn't for me. And, and you try to reach out. You try to develop a relationship. And all they do is reject you. When, when there's that kind of negative behavior, it's hard for us to take. It's always hard for us to take. The older brother became angry, refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. Somebody told the father this, right? His father goes out and he pleads with his son. He pleads with him. That, that's, that's, not a, that's not an easy word, right? It doesn't say he discussed it with him. It doesn't say he debated it with, with him. It says he pled. He, he, I mean, the, the other word that... The old word that we would put here is beseech. You ask with emotion. You ask imploring someone, begging them to come in. And, and I want you to notice something here. Because we've talked about this before. The father does this. He confronts without condemning. He confronts this older son without condemning him. And even though he's not condemned, even though he's not judged, even though the father lovingly approaches him and pleads with him to come in, he answers the father this way. It says, but he answered his father. And this is what he said. Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and I've never disobeyed your orders. Can you relate to the statement? I mean, I can relate to the statement. I, you know, I, I grew up a good kid. I didn't get into trouble. 
I got sent to the principal's office, but it was because my dad was the principal. You know, um, and and I, I I didn't get in trouble. I didn't go off and and do everything that the culture was doing and drink and and try drugs and all. I didn't do that. And it wasn't be, that I felt I was missing out on something. It was because I was a bystander as a pastor and educator's kid to all the destruction that came from that kind of lifestyle. And I didn't want to have any part of it. I didn't want to have any part of it. And I'm not in any way judging people who did those things. What I'm saying is I can relate to this. I'm, I'm the older son. Some of you are the older son too. And when that happens, we have to be even more careful of avoiding the older son syndrome. Because the older son goes on and he says something that's very revealing, that just stabs me in the heart. He said, you never gave me even a young goat far less valuable than the fattened calf. You never even gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. This is, this is what just convicts me in this statement. Because with this statement, the older son reveals that the father's friends are not his friends. Remember, the father is the one who welcomes younger sons who come home smelling like pigsties, who haven't had a shower, who haven't had a change of clothes. The father is the one who welcomes that kind of people home. And the older son says, huh, I, I don't want anything to do with your friends. I want to party with my friends. I want to party with my friends. This, this is so much a story about Jesus, isn't it? Because the, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law that were listening to the story, if you go back and look at the opening verse of Luke chapter 15, you'll find that Jesus tells the story for the benefit of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. Because they were really upset because Jesus hung out with prostitutes and tax collectors. Jesus hung out with Democrats or Republicans. Jesus hung out with LGBTQ plus people. Jesus hung out with all the wrong people. And the older son or didn't have, want to have anything to do with them. The father's friends were not the older son's friends. He didn't want to have anything to do with them. That, this one really hits me. Because you, you want to know basic information from the guy who grew up good and, you know, I've, yeah, uh, I don't really want to hang out with those people either. And it's that older son syndrome that I have to work really hard to avoid. Because you and I are the older son, aren't we? You and I are the ones that want to avoid the situations where, we're, where we are with people that we're uncomfortable with. We want to be with people that are like us. And, and one of the most amazing things about the life of Jesus is that Jesus was liked by people who were the least like Jesus. And he liked them back. The people least like Jesus liked Jesus. And he liked them back. What does that say about me? What does that say about you? What does that say about us avoiding this older son syndrome? Do we have people around us who actually like us, but they don't follow Jesus? 
Do we have people around us who uh, feel like we like them even though, even though they would freely admit that they don't follow Jesus? The older son goes on. He says, but when this son of yours, it's not his brother. You notice this? It's not his brother. He's putting it back on the father. The, I, I guarantee the older son has a, had a funeral for his brother, buried him. He didn't ever want to think of him again. He was done. It was over. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. And he just, I mean, he nails the father on this. He says, you know, this, this isn't right. This isn't fair. Hmm. Man, that's a charged word in our culture, isn't it? And you know what we learned from this statement? The older son left the father, but stayed home. The older son left the father, but stayed home. And if we're not careful, we fall into the category of the people that the Barna research says repel people from the church instead of attract people from the church because technically we've left the Father, but we stayed in the church. My son, the Father says. Again, he confronts without condemning. He loves this son unconditionally. He says, my son... You are always with me, and everything I have is yours. You know one of the things that gives us so much freedom? To be who Jesus has called us to be, to follow Jesus better every day. One of the things that gives us so much freedom to do that is our inheritance is not at risk. Your inheritance as a child of God, your inheritance as a follower of Jesus is not at risk. Can I say it any more emphatically? You do not risk losing your inheritance from God by reaching out to the people who need God the most. It's not at risk. Now, we have to be really careful with this because you know we, we become lone rangers. So if we really want to do this effectively, we're going to take a couple of Jesus followers with us to do this. Because they hold us accountable and they bear testimony to the effectiveness of our witness and outreach and unconditional love and confronting without condemning the people around us. So don't become a lone ranger. Don't think you can go do this by yourself and you're, you're strong enough to repel. Our, no, 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 no. Uh -uh. Don't, don't fall into that trap. Satan would love to get you in that trap. Remember, he's out to kill and steal and destroy you and me. And the father says, look, my son, oh, go back one slide. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But, says the father, we had to celebrate. We just had to do this. We have to be glad because this brother of yours, now he's referring to as the brother Remember the, young, the older son, this son of yours, now he's the brother from the father's perspective because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Oh, I, I know because I, I pray with some of you. I know the requests that come in to our prayer team. I, I see the depth of your concern. You have friends and neighbors and co-workers and family and kids and grandkids and parents and brothers and sisters that you desperately want to come to know Jesus. That you desperately want to come to know Jesus. And you would love to throw some parties for the, the people when they come back to Jesus. But my friends, if we're going to be effective at this, we have to avoid the older son syndrome. We just have to avoid this older son syndrome. So how can we say this? You know, in, see, stop, uh, 
judgmentalism and hypocrisy. Because it gets us in trouble. Over and over again, it just gets us in trouble. And it's just, sometimes it's our body language when we say something. Sometimes it's just our tone of voice. Sometimes it is our vocabulary that we choose. But we, we need to figure out how to present this message of Jesus and that we follow Jesus and do so with love for people that's unconditional. And as we've said so many times around here, we have to figure out how to accept people without affirming their behavior. And Jesus did this. The Father does this. The Father does not affirm the older son's behavior, but he loves him anyway. He accepts him anyway. And I know, I know that the media, I know that the even our educational system, everything says, if you accept this, this kid, this person, this coworker, this fan, if you accept them, it means that you're accepting all their behavior too. No, it doesn't. That's stupid. That's ignorant. Because it is extremely possible. And Jesus models it for us, and we have to learn to model Jesus. It's possible to accept someone without affirming their behavior. And we have to do this, my friends. We don't have a choice. Or else we become hypocrites and judgmental. And we lose our integrity, our credibility, and our authenticity. I want to remind you what Paul says. He, he says this in, in Ephesians chapter 4. He says, look, he says, don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths. But only what is helpful for building others up. That's what ought to come out of our mouths. That's what our body language ought to communicate. That's what our tone of voice ought to communicate. Because ultimately, ultimately, we have to fight this older brother syndrome. Because, man, I default to that so easily. And I, I am convicted because I so easily become the older brother. Our, our message, our purpose, our statement of vision at Northgate Church is that we want to inspire people to follow Jesus. And we want to eliminate as many obstacles as possible. Wow. Wow. How can you and I eliminate obstacles? How can we inspire people to follow Jesus? And the way this is worded is we're not only inspiring people to follow Jesus for the first time, we're inspiring each other to follow Jesus better. We want to follow Jesus. And we want to do it in a way that eliminates obstacles. One of the commentators that is so effectively written about the last half, this, this missed opportunity in this parable. One of the, the commentators who writes about this taught in the American University in Cairo for many years, and he studied Middle Eastern culture. And I just want to remind you that the Bible is a Middle Eastern book written to Middle Eastern people. One of the, one of the marvelous things about the Bible. One of the miraculous things about the Bible is that the Bible works in all kinds of different cultures, but it was written in a Middle Eastern culture to a Middle Eastern people. And yet God's miracle of inspiration is that it works all over. And one of the things this, this commentator did was he pressed people to tell him how the story ends. Because the way it stands is an open-ended story, isn't it? The father goes and he begs the, son to, the older son to come in, and the older son basically says, no way, you know, I, I'm not going in because of the, the lifestyle that my younger brother had, this son of yours he refers to him as. And the story just ends. We don't, we don't really know what happens, do we? 
So this guy kept challenging groups of Middle Eastern people, tell me, how does the story end? What happens? And over and over again, they would say, oh, no, we can't do that. We're not going there. And finally, after many years of pressing different groups of people, he got a group of elders in a village. And I mean, this is, this is just in the last 25, 30 years. He got a group of people to tell him how the story ends. And this is what they told him. The story ends when the older son picks up a stone and is the first in the village to begin stoning the father to death because he brings shame on the village and the family by welcoming back the younger son. Now, I just set this up very carefully. That's not what the Bible says. That's what these the leaders in this culture said. But it kind of rings true. Because that's exactly what they did to Jesus, isn't it? It's exactly what they did to Jesus. Oh, it was a cross and not a stone. But that's what they did. You see how destructive this older son syndrome can be? You see how powerful it is when we love unconditionally and confront people without judging them? Do you begin to grasp how unstoppable and irresistible the gospel is when we present it like the father in the story? But do you also see that it's going to cost you? It's going to cost me. There are times when we're going to lose jobs, we're going to, lose, we're going to def, be turned down for a loan, we're, we're going to run into all kinds of difficulties because if we stand up to the older son syndrome, people are going to pick up stones. Oh, I'm not suggesting that you're going to die because of it. But if you decide to do this, if you decide to reject the older son syndrome, there'll be a price to pay. There always is. My friends, if we're going to inspire people to follow Jesus and eliminate as many obstacles as possible, the first obstacle that I have to take out is me. My words, my tone of voice, my body language. I have to take that out of the picture. Because that's an obstacle for so many people. And I want to follow Jesus better. And I'm challenging you to follow Jesus better. What does that look like? Well, we'll go back to our last series. It looks like being a fearless, mighty warrior who loves unconditionally and confronts without condemning. Follow Jesus better. Would you stand? I'd like to pray for you. Heavenly Father, forgive me for all the times that I've been the older brother. Forgive me for my judgmentalism. Forgive me for my hypocrisy. Forgive me for saying one thing and doing something else. Lord, I pray. I pray for the people who hear my voice, whether they're in this room or watching us online. I pray, Father, that you would give us strength and endurance to rise above the level of the older son's hatred and disdain and criticism, and that you would give us strength to embrace you. Give us strength to follow Jesus. Help us to put one foot in front of the other and walk in the paths that Jesus walks because we want to be like him. 
we really want to be like Jesus. So help us follow him better this week. Help us follow him better this afternoon. In Jesus' name, amen.